Welcome everyone to Silvo Pasture 2021, a two-part webinar celebrating trees, pasture and biodiversity. My name is Lucy Munro, um, I'm from Glenrack and I will be hosting this webinar in place of Kelly Walsh until she arrives, which should be very soon. Um, if you have any problems, feel free to send me a message through Zoom um, and I'll try to help you. Uh, but without further ado, I'll uh, introduce you to Southern New England Land Care Coordinator, Struan Ferguson, who will get the show running. Thanks, Struan. Um, sorry about that. Um, welcome everyone to um, Silver Pasture 2021. Um, you've already met Lucy Munro and Kelly Walsh, um, who's the master webar webinarian from Glen Innes um, Natural Resources Advisory Committee, or Glenrack as we call them, will be hosting the series, but she's on her way. She's just coming from a um, photographing the gorges in a chopper, so she'll be arriving as soon as she can. So thanks, Lucy, for filling in. Um, Southern New England Land Care acknowledges the traditional custodians of, on the land on which we are gathered today. We pay our respects to Aboriginal elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to other First Nations peoples. We celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal culture, languages and connection to land and water throughout Australia. So just a definition, silver pasture is generally recognised as a form of agroforestry where trees and shrubs are integrated with pastures for forage and grazing purposes. We're indeed fortunate to have as our key speakers for this webinar series, Rowan Reid and Professor Nick Reid, no relation. Um, I'll introduce Nick in the second part of this series. Um, so speaking today is Rowan Reid, an advocate for agroforestry from the Otways region of Victoria author of the book Heartwood, founder of the Australian Master Tree Grower Program and the Australian Agroforestry Foundation. Um, speakers for the Silver Pasture Practice Session today, um, which will be after Rowan speaks, um, is Rowan will be speaking on species selection. Scott Hall will be speaking on maintenance and succession. Um, Scott Hall is an advocate and educator for syntropic agriculture or successional agroforestry. He's based in the Northern Rivers of New South Wales and travels around the country running projects, um, educating and supporting landholders in this field. Um, Michael Taylor will be speaking on harvesting. Um, Michael Taylor is the son of John and Vicki Taylor of Kentucky, New South Wales. 20, 29 years ago hosted TreeFest, um, a field day attended by 6,000 people to showcase techniques in broad scale tree planting at the time in response to widespread New England dieback. The Taylor family have been practitioners of silver pasture um, throughout this period. Michael is now, now runs the Taylor family's silver pasture enterprise. Um, we've allocated some time for questions and answers, and that will take place after the Silver Pasture practice session. Um, please write your questions in the chat box. Um, you can open, you can find the chat icon at the bottom of your screen, the Zoom screen, um, and that will open the chat box, which will occur on the right hand side of your screen. And Kelly will then, Kelly or Lucy will then put your questions to the speakers. So if you could do that, we can then record your questions. And then if there's any follow up later on, we can follow that up. So how did this event come about? Um, Michael approached Southern New England Land Care with the idea of running a field day um, focused on silver pasture theory and techniques on the Taylor property. Um, we've been awarded a National Land Care Program Phase 2 Smart Farm Small Grant entitled Mustering Members for Climate Change Challenges. So we needed to run an event focused upon species selection um, for revegetation success. So here we are, we brought those two things together. Um, we would have loved to have run an outdoor on-farm event, and we did have that plan for last year. However, given the disruption caused by COVID, we decided to host an online alternative. Um, excuse me. So land managers um, planting trees and shrubs 
will need them to survive for a forecast 1.5 to 2 degrees um, in average temperatures and the associated abnormal maximum temperatures. Um, the strategies for establishing seedlings are well known and widely applied, but there is much doubt about the species to plant for success into the future. Our calling question for this series is, um, what do you see as the climate change challenge, challenges um, for species selection if we want success in reed vegetation and silver pasture? Please keep this question in the back of your mind um, as after the Q&A session, Karen Zirkler from Southern New England Landcare will facilitate a short reflective workshop. Um, silver pasture 2021 is supported by the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. We will ask you, um, if you would, after the series finishes to complete a survey monkey evaluation. Um, we'll send everyone out a link. It'd be great if you could fill that in for us. It won't take you very long. I think it's between three and five minutes. So your answers to this survey will help us to report back to the federal government and will help us improve future events like this in the future. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. And um, I'll hand over to Rowan. Just a moment now. Okay, everyone, thanks very much. I'm just going to uh, turn my own video off because I've got some videos in my presentation. Thanks very much to Michael Taylor and the team up there. Um, I was looking forward to traveling up and joining you and uh, dedicating four days to, to getting back up on the tablelands. I've been there a few times over the years, um, but this will have to do. And uh, so I'm on the farm and enjoying the time I've got to spend there. Uh, what I want to talk about is uh, something we've been sort of focused on for, for a long, long time about fitting, fitting forestry or trees into the farming landscape, which is a bit broader than the uh, silver pastoral thing, but I think you'll see the connection there as, uh, as sh it's shown. Uh, I'm a forester uh, in the sense that I grow trees and cut them down and, and uh, I'm pretty passionate about the timber side of it. Uh, and I'm also a forest scientist and 20 years at Melbourne University. I left there 10 years ago to concentrate on taking our master tree grower program and other activities uh, internationally and getting back onto the farm full time so that I can actually uh, take, the, take the next stage of our, our tree planting experience. I uh, love travelling around the world. This was the World Agroforestry Conference in France uh, 2019. And uh, traveling around Australia or overseas really, really gives me an opportunity to challenge some of my thinking and I hope challenge some other people. And I'd, I'd like, to, like to try that a little bit too. Uh, forestry as a, as a discipline, and uh, most people think of it uh, as native forestry in public land, uh, big, large monoculture plantations. Um, I wasn't particularly interested as a, as a young forester working in any of those areas. And uh, I was concerned about the, the public, public view of forestry and particularly the farming community that I was spending a bit more time in. Uh, very concerned about farms being purchased and put into industrial plantations. Very concerned about uh, large scale clear fells in nearby native forest areas. And uh, I take this quote adapted from uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance talking about technology in the hippie era of the 60s. Uh, ugly, ugliness is not inherent in forestry. Forestry is just the science and practice of growing trees. Uh, this is a view of the botanic garden, botanical gardens in Melbourne. Uh, that is a forest created by someone who's managing it and manipulating it or, or many people over a long period of time. So taking that idea of trying to make forestry attractive, my aim was to work in the farming community. My family history is in farming for a long period of time. This is uh, my grandfather's farm, uh, which my mother owned up until, half owned up until the, the 80s. Uh, and that's way up there at Walgett, a low rainfall area where for over a hundred years, the family had uh, grazed native vegetation. I hope in a sustainable way. Uh, it was certainly the native vegetation was still there or most of it, uh, where the areas that weren't cleared. 
And if you think about clearing and agriculture and farmers, uh, outside the, the rangelands and the desert areas, that dark blue is freehold private land, about 60% of the country, owned and operated predominantly by family farmers. Uh, that's not where forestry has worked in the past, but given the impacts of agriculture on the landscape, adding to this now the loss of carbon in the landscape that we've seen or identified in the last few years, it's, it's, it's clear to me, or it was an exciting challenge for me to think about how my discipline of forestry could work in that agricultural landscape and create something quite different, uh, creating beautiful, productive, sustainable landscapes involving that science and practice of tree growing. Straight away, I knew that it wouldn't look anything like the forestry that I'd learnt at university. And it certainly wouldn't just be a scaled down version of uh, forestry plantations as most people saw it. It would be quite different because it involves family farmers. So my focus in the developing the Master Tree Grower Program, working with agroforestry networks around the country, trying to promote farmer groups in, in Vanuatu in Indonesia and Africa, has really been about not the trees at all, it's about the people making the decisions about what trees and why they'll be planted in the landscape. And that's going to be my emphasis away from this notion of agroforestry or silver pasture. Pasture can be described as a system that you can visualize. Forget that. Focus on the farmers who are making these decisions. I wasn't going to go up to Walgut, the old family farm, because I'm a coastal person. And I, I grew up in a forest uh, of red ironbarks. And I took this photo of uh, where I walk every summer in between my surfing periods, which, uh, which I can do, still do, approaching 60. And uh, you look at this and it's, it's sort of reminiscent of that uh, frost poem about two roads diverging in a wood. And I took the one less traveled by and that make all the difference. Well, I'm not happy with two roads because forestry has been divided into forestry for profit and forestry for conservation. And to divide, have a dichotomy like that really undermines its great potential. I'm looking for forestry to be a marriage of conservation and profit, determined by those decision makers, the landholders, and supported by stakeholders who want both profit and conservation from that agricultural landscape and from the trees that will be planted. I'm very concerned about the, the dividing of our education system into environment and profit into our in many of the land care areas into conservation, and then you've got farm forestry projects for profit. And Snelk has been a leader of actually looking at how you can actually look at this marriage of the two. So back in 1987, not long after my mum sold that farm up at Walgett, when it was evident that none of the grandchildren, eight of us from two families would be interested in living there, she, gave, she challenged me with a question. And uh, this was actually in Nairobi where we met. And she said, I've sold the family farm. I want to ask you a simple question. Is there any, can you give me a good reason why at the age of 25, you would want farmland in your grandfather's memory? And uh, I traveled Europe and, and looked at agroforestry around the world. And I said, I want to make forestry attractive to family farmers. And it's not happening through government and it's not happening through NGOs. And it's certainly not happening through some of the research organizations. I'm going to have to try and describe it by doing it myself. And this is where we are now, uh, 33 years later. Well, this was age 31, uh, harvesting trees that we, we planted for conservation, biodiversity, and all those other reasons. But now we're harvesting trees. That was a native tree, uh, the messmate that I planted. Uh, this one's uh, redwood. We've harvested our first redwood this year. Uh, that's 33 years old, 82 centimetres in diameter, pruned up to eight point sorry, seven metres on this one. And uh, I'm harvesting one of our trees. You can see how the trees are spaced and they're managed quite different to a parkland. And we'll talk more about that. Showing some of the equipment that we use. Uh, this is Sam putting in a Humboldt wedge, which is reversed to what most people do. Something that was developed in California for felling redwoods. So it's, it's a bit of a nod to them, uh, felling our first redwood. Sam signaling to me to pull the winch in and I'm using my remote control. Uh, to pull the logging winch up and uh, saves him banging wedges into the back and then we're pulling over trees. So we started that getting the idea of what it's going to be like to get to that uh, the end 
but I don't want to see it at the end. I don't like the term rotation. That idea of a rotation seems to suggest you go back to where you started from. And what I'm keen to do is uh, never go back. I, I keep getting these, uh, these options. So there's the logging winch on our old tractor. I've got a bigger one now because the logs are getting too big. And uh, pulling up that mess made or a three meter prune section of it. Uh, this is our little sawmill. I'd love to sell these logs, but uh, native forestry has been uh, stopped in our region and all the sawmills are closed. So if I'm going to get a product to demonstrate the potential, I've got to do it myself, which is a shame. Um, I'm happy to do it on a, on a hobby basis, but uh, it's very labor intensive. This is milling a blackwood that I actually planted. It was about 50 centimeters in diameter in 33 years. And uh, we harvested that one. And you'll actually see the milling of that on Gardening Australia next month. And uh, that's what I cut that log up for. We dry the timber in a solar kiln. Uh, the solar part is the heat. It's all run on mains electricity, the fans and the computer system with the aim of getting our timber down to between 10 and 14 percent moisture content for furniture grade. Building, it's a bit more flexible for other uses. It doesn't so matter. But if we can get furniture grade timber out of these trees, maybe we can demonstrate the potential to future buyers, but also to them, to landholders as well. That timber from that mess mate that I cut down, I got about uh, two cubic meters of, uh, of sawn timber out of that. It was over 90 centimeters in diameter almost. And uh, I sold a cubic meter to Mark Tucky Furniture, a big furniture maker who's got showrooms in Sydney and Melbourne. I went into the showroom and said, does anyone actually ask for sustainably grown uh, native timber? And he said, I don't think he wants them to because he can't get any. So I said, well, can you can you try some of our timber? And he made uh, two, two or three beds and some tables out of that timber and about $20,000 worth. And I'm not sure, don't know if it's all sold or what the opinion was, but the furniture looked great. And uh, from $2,000 worth of timber I sold, and that, that reflects what I got for that tree and part of another one next to it. But I'm gonna say, be a bit frank and say, uh, despite my enthusiasm for timber, uh, I discourage any farmer of planting trees just for timber. Plant, it takes too long. Uh, you might die before your trees mature. Uh, it's too risky. Every landholder knows <clears throat> the risk of flood, fire, drought, cyclone, and increasing temperatures we're talking about today make it incredibly risky environmentally. There's also so many risks. The yields and returns are virtually unknown. Uh, I, I get frustrated at forester economists who so confidently write down what they expect the return it to be from their forestry program. And for a sensitivity analysis, they assume plus or minus 20% in the returns. Well, the truth is it's plus or minus 100%. You've got absolutely no idea whether you'll sell at all or whether you'll get it to return greater. Uh, there might be no market. The mills disappear. And the overriding one that I know increasingly farmers are concerned about, governments may actually take your rights away to harvest. And this is something we need to, uh, we need to talk about. We need to talk to the wider community about whether farmers are gonna retain the rights to harvest the trees, even the ones they plant or encourage to grow. I want you to plant trees because you want trees. And this is um, partly the problem with forestry and rotations that uh, a lot of foresters, uh, the way they design and plant their plantations is as if they don't like trees, they can't wait to cut them down. But the farming community, it's, it's where far trees can actually support your agricultural system. You'll plant them for shade or shelter. So clearly when you harvest, you don't want to harvest them all because you want shade and shelter. You want soil and water conservation values, such as fencing out our creek and planting trees or solving to water logging problems. You want fire protection. Well, you certainly don't want to make your fire hazards worse by planting trees uh, or managing them inappropriately in the landscape. Uh, you want wildlife conservation, or most of us do. Most farmers, even though you can't monetize biodiversity, uh, I just love the way they're so enthusiastic about seeing biodiversity return, bird species, uh, mammals returning to their property. It's a, it's a sense of pride, a sense of idea that, uh, that they're on the right track, that things are improving, and maybe it will be reflected in the resilience and the sustainability of their farming operation. But also, it may give them and us as landholders that uh, 
that uh, social license that we, we need, where we want trust from the community that we're actually managing a, a, a landscape for the long term and for multiple values, rather than even if we cut one tree down, it's, it's not about the one tree being cut down, it's about the landscape. Aesthetics and mental health, uh, not something you learn about in forestry school, but uh, aesthetics is, is, it's got to be there. It, you have to be proud, enjoy, be, have pride in the property. You have to feel like, as I said, it's improving. Uh, you want to like where you are and certainly increasingly as I get older, you want the next generation and even the generation after that, now that I'm having grandchildren, to like what they see. And that will be, in essence, our legacy that we leave behind. So on our property, we didn't just plant blocks of plantation. The reason I told my mother I needed uh, land at 25 is because I wasn't going to do forestry the way that forestry was being promoted. I was going to fence out the creek, as you'd expect, uh, if you're worried about conservation, plant it with native trees, as you might expect. But in this case, I didn't plant local indigenous species. I, I swapped species. Uh, I took out some and replaced them with a, an analogous spe species from a different area or location that I thought might be more valuable for timber in some way. And we, we developed that. So this is uh, a view of the creek now. And uh, I love a presentation that David Lindemeyer did to a group of farmers in Tassie uh, 15, 20 years ago. And he said, messy farms, we need messy farms. And when it comes to waterways, we need messy waterways. We need woody debris in, in dams. And I, I worked in Iowa in North America where they actually plant trees on the banks to encourage the beavers to make dams. Well, we don't have beavers, but we've got chainsaws. And we should be actively creating that woody debris in the waterway that creates that series of ponds that we're hearing so much about, which holds water back up into the hills before it rushes down into the gullies, that re-wets the landscape and in that fashion. You'll also see there a lot of uh, uh, blackwood is mostly, but I've also got silky oak and casuarina and red cedar and, and uh, a range of other slow growing shade tolerant trees growing underneath the eucalypts along the creek. And they're my succession. I'm now in the, in the phase of removing the eucalypts, which was always the intention, and transitioning that creek into a temperate subtropical rainforest of timber. It'll provide darker shade, a different habitat element for the waterway, cool the water. Uh, it'll suppress the grass and uh, allow more native understory ground covers to develop. And we'll actually have that large woody debris left behind when I take the soil legs out. And you'll have something that's celebrated enough, in my view, the stumps. We have stumps of eucalypts along the creek now that are large reservoirs of fungus which store water and provide nutrients. And as a result, that understory, those trees that I'm growing underneath the eucalypts, are not only getting released by having more light, they're growing much faster through the summer because they've got their own sponge of water to tap into, to develop. And that sponge rehydrates every time we get the creek to flood. So it's an exciting ecology, which has been driven more rapidly through the successional stages by my active harvesting of timber. We plant exotics. Uh, I've tried a number of different native species to try and solve this problem of our tunnel erosion on sodic soils. Uh, I'm showing a group of students the chemistry of it. I haven't got time to go into the chemistry, but I haven't found a species other than redwoods that will actually solve the problem. So on the left here, we've got tunnel erosion under my natives during a storm event. There's, the native trees won't grow into that toxic subsoil, sodic clay. Uh, underneath the redwoods in the same storm event where there's soil erosion, there's tunnel erosion above and below where I've got just 18 trees, one of them which I just harvested this year. Uh, you can see the water flowing clear across the surface. There are no tunnels because the redwoods have the ability to grow in the clay. I would encourage land care to not be just fixated with local native species because we've got problems here that other species and management options can actually help solve. Just on harvesting the redwood, the root system doesn't die. Uh, the root system is still there. I'll grow a new tree probably in less than 30 years of a similar size uh, off that live root system. We plant oaks for fire protection. Don't mind the aesthetics. Certainly the deciduous nature helps with pasture during the winter because light is a limiting factor, obviously, during our winter months. They also provide autumn fodder. 
These are the sheep that graze our property run by a neighbour. Uh, we've got 250 breeding ewes that come through the property. And uh, I've got a little note there about oak poisoning that I have to mention because there are some cases, but uh, Belinda who runs these sheep uh, says no problem. They just seem to fatten up when there's no grass. Fatten up at a great time of year as they're entering into their lambing phase. We plant shelter for shelter and shade for lambing. So this is winter lambing on the property. Uh, great for shelter. It's, it's basically a, a lambing refuge now, the whole property. And we plant for biodiversity. This is a night vision camera on a silky oak that I pruned up and spotting the sugar gliders. The sugar gliders, you don't get them without trees. It's pretty obvious, uh, but you need more than just hollows. You need feed trees. And uh, the silky oak, which is an exotic to our area, provides really good winter feed. The sugar gliders chew into them and uh, farm the tree by eating that uh, carbohydrate rich sap or gum that comes out of the tree when they, when they do it. So we're actually doing bird surveys now. Um, we're not quite up to what Andrew Stewart, who's just joined us, has about 115 species or so on his property, but we're getting there and we're showing that the trees are actually underpinning the biodiversity layer, even though it's not locally indigenous species only locked up from agriculture or are locked up from production. And this is the challenge that we need to share with the wider community, that conservation is not something that happens behind a fence, it has to happen across the landscape in all the elements and uh, of our productive landscape. And that will include forests that are managed as well. So this is one of our combinations. It's, a, it's another succession forest. I've got fast growing poplars, which I'm starting to harvest now. And I've got very slow growing black walnuts here. This is on a little patch of this soil. And uh, um, Nick Reed's join us just a moment. I don't know whether I'm the only one who can admit these people. Uh, by taking the poplars out, place for these black walnuts to grow on now. Uh, funnily enough, the black walnuts are actually providing more income than the poplars at present because we can sell the nuts to other landholders who grow them. And that, that really highlights the, uh, the issue. A lot of uh, economists say, well, farmers won't grow things that take 60 years to grow. And, and you hear this all the time, or you do a discounted cash flow analysis on the seed, a, 10, a, a 50 cent walnut seed and nothing will be economic if it takes 60 years to grow. But farmers are choosing, so they're voting with their feet. They're choosing to grow species, both native and exotic, which take a long time which I, I argue reflects the fact that family farming is about generational farming. It's not about one person planting trees, harvesting them, putting the money in the bank and saying, I did well, because when you approach forestry that way, no one replants because they've become too old or because they don't have a tax problem anymore. Generational forestry of the type we can achieve by working with family farmers who want to pass the farm on to future generations offers much more to conservation because the, farm, the trees will stay in the landscape, but also offers a lot more to forestry because industry want trees that, the ones that take longer to grow, often higher value species or better quality timber as a result of coming through there. So we manage, the trees for profit because we can. It's like keeping the dream alive, as Andrew Stewart taught me. It's, uh, it's like icing on the cake. And if you don't manage them, you don't get the icing. Uh, why would you manage for timber? Because you might live to be 100 years old. Timber prices might actually go up, and we're starting to see that right at the moment. Uh, you might actually want to harvest some timber yourself. The table there is right behind me outside. Uh, I grew that table. And having the family sit around that table for a dinner is, uh, is, is, is a matter of pride. And now we're building a house, extending the house right next to where I am, using our own timber. Uh, governments might actually see common sense. So I'm getting a bit old and I'm getting a bit worried about whether we'll see that. But uh, over the time, they might actually recognise that family forestry can actually deliver conservation outcomes, including carbon and way of doing it. And you might regret not managing your trees. How many farms have I been on? where the, the trees grow really well and the landholders say, uh, sorry, Rowan, I should have managed them. Well, they regret the fact that they didn't put that little bit of time in to You'll pruning see, the trees when they're well young over and spacing the eight them. centimetre mark. So there's many branches I'll have to remove off this. I work from what I can from the ground. Cutting the branches off, not flush with the stem, 
just a little bit out so that they can heal over the collar. There's no chance of injury. Flying off as we go up. Good work, work platform. Two tools, so the loppers you saw and the hand tool. For a branch that's in an awkward spot. I'm working up the stem. First find out where my eight centimetre mark is. Every branch up to that point removed. You can see how easy it is when you're on the harness to relax. Now, as I look up, I want to make sure there's no branches over two centimetres in size. This one's definitely larger. Once I've reached my six metre mark, and this ladder is three metres to here, so I've still got a way to go next year, I'll have a tall prune tree with a straight stem, pretty straight, and Sydney blue gum grow it out to about 80 centimetres in diameter, up to the first branch. Top of the tree can spread out. That's the factory that grows the produces the sugars that run down the stem and grow diameter. So the pruning work is a little bit every year, but through that, uh, probably 10 minutes per tree, I estimate, over its life. You can turn a tree that would otherwise be only good for firewood into potentially furniture grade. That's the story. So that thinning side is so important. Thinning's fantastic. Uh, it allows you to concentrate growth on the less trees. Uh, it reduces your pruning cost because you prune less trees, increases the return for every hour you spend pruning and makes trees grow faster. Uh, this is just an example from Thailand. The tree on the left is 63 years old and the one on the right is 25. The one on the right was thinned and pruned. This is a, a log of pine from Tasmania. It just tells the story of regret. You can see the tree grew really well, but competition slowed growth down to millimetres, but 10 years of almost no growth and they thinned the forest and it grew as well as it did beforehand. You can actually grow your trees much fatter if you give them space to grow, but grow them close together when they're young because they shelter each other or you're mixing the species, you're, you're spreading risk and dealing with uncertainty, but then progressively manage it, thin the trees out and give those best trees some space. I've done some work on how much space they need and species differ. Coast redwoods, you can have them really close together, about six metres when they're 60 centimetres in diameter. But mountain ash, eucalypts need nine, 10 metres and English oak and blackwood, maybe 11, 12, 13 metres between trees. So you'll actually have difference based on the canopy structure of that. And thinning is often the hardest thing for a farmer to do. You've cared for these trees for years, but unless you understand that 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 neutral shelter has turned into competition, which is slowing growth. You've got a decision to make. Are you going to let your trees take 80, 100 years to grow, like these English oak, or are you actually going to thin them? And I thinned this forest after seeing and studying English oak in Wales, came home next day, cut half my oak trees down. Perfectly good trees, but I knew that I would get faster growth, better quality timber, and a better outcome for the farm by doing that. So pruning, thinning, management of your trees is what we do here. Different management techniques on other sites. It offers us fire protection by spreading out the trees. We can graze more. We get climate resilience because trees are under less competition for moisture. We get better machine access into our areas so we can, we can do understory maintenance. I think it looks more attractive. It's certainly easier to harvest trees if they're, they're eight, 10 meters apart, like I showed you in the videos. And, don't worry about the products. The products you get from small diameter young trees has been a big problem in forestry because everyone seems to think they want to make money from those. Forget it. Most of them, I just let them rot back into the land. Uh, we did take those oak thinnings though. We inoculated them with shiitake mushrooms and we grew shiitake on them. And uh, so we got some, some product out of them in a sense. We do graze between most of the trees. It's more like a parkland. Uh, we graze from the time we plant it because we're worried about fire and weeds and aesthetics and access. And uh, so grazing is something we did constantly. We tried a number of different techniques of protecting the trees and we set it on, settled on a flexible tall guard that seems to work well with wallabies that we now have plenty of, kangaroos and, and sheep. So that allows us to plant trees wherever we want. 
about pasture under trees. In a temperate landscape, I don't know of a species, if you plant it, you'll get more pasture. Uh, maybe in the tropics where sunlight's not limiting, but down here in most temperate areas, like up in the tablelands, uh, the more trees, the worse it is. But that can't, that's not always a negative. Uh, you can use deciduous trees that have the advantage over evergreens. Uh, you can grow slow growing trees. It might sound perverse, but slow growing smaller trees may be a better option if you're looking at pasture than fast and big ones, particularly if those slow growing ones are gonna be more valuable. Uh, soil depth is important because it's where the roots go. Uh, don't plant eucalypts and pines if you want pasture. Uh, bark type and litter is important, such as casuarinas really dump a lot of uh, needles and suppress growth underneath. And nitrogen fixing trees can be a great advantage in some way. But pruning and spacing of trees does help and extend the grazing period to the point that when grazing declines, you're not so worried about it because you can see the value in the timber. Uh, don't plant trees on cropping and hay cutting. I can't believe the agroforestry research around the world, which is planting trees across perfectly good cropping land when they've got whole landscapes that need trees. Uh, it's diminishing returns. Uh, from cropping if you've got competition. You reduce your flexibility and ad adaptability. You've got sticks and roots. And I'm really frustrated by agroforestry research that seems to think agroforestry is putting strips of trees on perfectly good agricultural land that doesn't really need trees. There are gullies, there's shelter belts, there's unproductive land. Plant trees where you need trees. Start there, it's the lowest risk and has the greatest opportunity. Don't just copy other people. Don't try to, try to get systems off the net and plug them in your landscape, they won't fit. Those off the shelf solutions won't adapt and fit into your landscape very well. Don't just put a block of trees on the, on the farm, look at the landscape, fit the trees in much better. Andrew Stewart's shoulder belt is a classy example of a farmer who's designed a belt that has three rows of spotted gum for timber, an understory to block the wind and provide biodiversity, and even got flowering species so that they can produce some uh, non-timber crop out of that landscape as well. So Andrew and many other farmers have taken that master tree grower idea about it's not about the trees, it's about involving the farmers in the designing of these complex landscapes that bring things together in some way. Complex landscapes can be a mess. Don't follow others, be a leader, be like a conductor of an orchestra, orchestra and uh, feel like that you're manipulating the growth of your forest and your trees for the reasons that are important to you. And I'll leave you with this video. It shows a, a young T. Marie's kid rolling a, a tire down the hill and using a stick. When your forest grows, it's a bit like that tire running down the hill. If it grows well, it'll just con continue developing. You don't have to push growth and fight against growth. You can use that. But what you need to do is be like that conductor of the orchestra, like this kid with a stick, just timely and carefully and, and just manipulate the growth of that forest and direct the growth so you achieve the series of range of outcomes that you're actually, actually looking for. This is about farmers fitting forestry into their farming landscape so that you get a diversity of forests that reflects the diversity that's inherited in the community. And that's not what we're seeing in terms of agroforestry and farm forestry research around the world. So I thank you very much. We're right on half an hour. Uh, gone through some stuff pretty quickly, but that's, I hope it generates some discussion. Thanks very much. Um, thanks very much, Ron. Um, that was great. Um, just um, so um, the the next session is um, practical implementation or um, silver pasture practice. So uh, Rowan's going to speak on species selection. Um, Rowan, are you still with us? Yeah, can't you see? Yes, I can now. <laughs> um, I've talked about a lot of this, but I'll just I'll just put a few slides up to generate discussion. Uh, we have had a one degree temperature rise on this property since I planted uh, those trees back in 1987, our first trees. Uh, I do things very differently now. And that's one of the reasons, one of the journeys that I encourage landholders to take. Don't plant all your trees at once. Don't ask an expert what you should grow and plant just one. Uh, spread the risk. But when it comes to climate change particularly, we're seeing some really interesting things play out. The more south you go in the country,
the less drought adapted the species tend to be. Uh, it's to do with their water management and, uh, and some species just use water if it's available and they don't manage their water needs. So they don't have drought strategies. And they also don't have levels of fire resistance or, or ability to, you know, some of them regenerate after fire certainly, but the actual species, the bark's not thick enough or it doesn't have fire adapted strategies. So I've got mountain ash there. Uh, we've had mountain ash, which is a high rainfall species. Just to assure people, our rainfall here is, has dropped to about 650 millimetres of rain. Uh, it's well below what you might need for mountain ash, but they've grown very well, as you can see in the photo. But it's not, I'm not going to plant any more of them. They, they simply can't deal with the heat waves. Uh, some, if you're going to plant uh, eucalypts or the eucalypt family, uh, you've got other species, red ironbark and spotted gum, that are slower growing. And that slower growth is really a reflection of their water management. And spotted gum have a very thick bark. And they, naturally, they have a thick bark to protect the cambium from drying out from insect attack and also from fire. So you actually have adaptive strategies in some species, particularly about protecting and being able to shut down and survive till the rains come again. And uh, the inability of some species of the dieback we're seeing up in the New England uh, through climate change is possibly because those species haven't been able to adapt. And we'll hear from Nick Reed about this in the, no doubt, uh, their ability to adapt to the increasing temperatures that they haven't experienced before. I plant a lot of New South Wales species. There's a tendency to think rainforest species aren't adapted to low rainfall. It's quite the opposite. The rainforest species in New South Wales and Queensland are incredibly well adapted to when there's no rain. And because the wet season is during the hot period and often over millennia, the wet season haven't arrived. So they've all got a strategy and the red cedar is just drops its leaves and waits. Uh, similarly, the Australian silky oak uh, it's very, very, it controls water loss, but it also shuts down and drops leaves. So this is a strategy they have. And to think that rainforest species aren't drought adapted is, is a bit short-sighted. It's not thinking about where the opportunity lies. And we're finding the Australian red cedar grows really well. They're behind me in that photo. We don't have tip moth and uh, they're frost adapted uh, to some extent. And uh, so they're pretty clever trees. Uh, Exotics are part of the strategy, and you'll find the same sort of adaptive characteristics in some of the exotics we grow. Uh, the redwood has a ligna tuber. Uh, I didn't know this when I planted them, but I started seeing them develop. I started understanding why they grow slow in their early years. That photo is of a ligna tuber in New Zealand. I've got one growing above the ground now. Usually they're below ground. It means when you cut the tree down, they can grow back but also it can actually store moisture and nutrients and extend its own growing season. And as a result, the redwoods we have now are the fastest growing trees on the property for growth per year once they're established as a result of having that ligna tuber, I believe. Also got a very thick bark with a high tannin content, which is resistant to fire. So it's got strategies in there. And again, oak trees, people like to think that they, they, you know, they need a lot of rain. Well, you guys know that they're probably one of the more drought adaptive uh, genuses that you've got on the New England tablelands and their ability to shut down, drop their leaves. Uh, some of them have actually got ligna tubers or store a lot of energy in their roots to get through periods like a camel hump. So you start looking not at how fast a species grow, not only if it's adapted to soils that you've got, but what is its strategy when moisture is going to run out or temperatures are going to increase? Black walnut, again, we must have a high rainfall to grow black walnut. No, it just drops its leaves during the drought. We've had two of the worst droughts uh, that most farmers can remember in the 30 years. And as I said, a dropping rainfall. Black walnut just shuts down earlier in, the, in, in autumn as a result of that. And then I'm growing things like banksia from much drier areas. This is the Western Australian River banksia that has a beautiful timber. And as I said, I'm tendency to grow slower growing trees that have a higher value and a smaller tree. And that's not necessarily a negative and that will make harvesting easier, but also allow me to select species that grow much slower uh, and have less water needs and are less likely to actually suffer in the heat. And that can be a positive as well. So planter diversity, that'll give you resilience. It'll also give you knowledge and you can use that knowledge to adapt your plantings over time. And for an example of resilience, there's a bed I made for the family uh, using a range of different species. And uh, having a range of species is a great thing when you're at the timber end, 
because you find different values, different uses for each type of wood. So that's a little story on uh, what I think about climate and species selection. Um, that is fascinating, Ron. Thank you. So um, have we got Lucy? Are you there, Lucy? Um, no. Right. So I'll, um, um, Scott, are you able to talk? Are you with us, Scott? Rightio. So what I will do is I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to cut to a video that Scott um, Scott has sent me. Um, I thought he would have been online by now. Um, Drew, and I think he is. Yep. Just need to unmute Scott. Stop share, sorry. Um, Are you Scott's iPhone? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great, Scott. So um, sure. just like to introduce Scott Hall, everyone, and take it away, Scott. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I did a pre recorded video. Uh, I did that for the duration of 10 minutes. Um, but uh, if that's not gonna, is that gonna play? Oh, now, now I can't hear anybody else. Okay, um, I'll play it, Scott. So I'll just do. Yeah, screen. I can yeah. speak, or you can play that. Whatever you like, it's I'm cool. We'll give it a go. Righto. I can speak while uh, I, I haven't got any volume coming through on mine. You, let me try on my screen. Hi, Scott. It's Lucy Munro. Um, let me give it a go through and I'll just try and play it on my idea. Otherwise, I can keep, I can talk over the visuals if you like. Yeah. Just give me one moment. Hello, everybody. Uh, really happy to share this with you all. And, uh, I've got a lot of video here to share of a lot of different things. Now, I do apologize for the, a lot of the shaky video here. Quite amateur recording. Now, one thing I'd like to say is a lot of this is um, a lot of this video, all of this video is recorded in a subtropical climate. Now, the, the thing is that this is all climate universal. So even though this is in the subtropics, the species remain constant as far as how they're selected um, via life cycle and strata. So uh, the, in all climates, there are analogues. There's just different plants that perform the same role in, uh, in, in various climates. So, you know, you've got all of the emergence, your high strata, your medium strata, your low strata and life cycle differentials, and they all occur in all climates. It's just the species that are different. They all go together in what we call a consortium. Now, one thing particularly with strata is that with uh, strata, we, we identify plants that have different uh, light requirements. So we use monoculture as a reference for 100%, but when we start to organize plants according to the light requirements, we can get 200% just with uh, combining stratification, light requirements of plants and that 
doesn't displace any plan. So that's just the beginning of how we organise consortium. There are life cycle differentials, uh, which uh, are uh, driven by species succession as well. And the whole lot combines to about 300% versus monoculture. And when all of these things are put together and managed the right way, they form a dynamic, which produces growth pulses, et cetera. Now, it's quite similar to H holistic management, HM in a way, with the, uh, the plateauing of the, 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 the growth curve, the S curve, et cetera, and the, the steep part. And, and like with the climate, you know, you can, you can use uh, managed grazing in all climates. The same with this. It's just that all that happens is the species change. Um, the management doesn't change. So although you've got a lot of pictures here in my video, the, uh, the thing is, you know, these pictures of subtropical plants, this is all applicable across all climates. So what you'll see too, especially right here in this part, in between the tree rows, we've got crops. Now in a silver pasture context, that crop will be grass and cattle. So it's just management based. So what you choose, I mean, we can get the power out of that grass and give it to the cattle via the growth pulses that are provided and the growth hormones that are provided by the tree rows. And um, that's what we choose to yield. So we can direct that power however we choose. And I think silver pasture is a real, a very, very appropriate application of successional agroforestry or syntropic agriculture in Australia. It's a real, it's, it's a really awesome way to, to start managing tree rows and to get those growth hormones going in pulses, especially if you time the pruning cycle to get a growth pulse and the re release of gibberellic acid with a grazing impact together. That's where the whole really becomes more than the sum of the parts. So in this particular clip right here that we're looking at, well, I will note that the soil's always covered in these systems and we're always building soil. But uh, we, the, if you have a look at the eucalypts, the, um, they've been pruned not long ago and that cassava, which is above the soil that I'm examining right now, has just gone through a huge growth pulse. And that cassava, you know, it's, it's not a fast growing plant. It'll grow quite big over the course of the season, but as you, you see this cassava coming up very shortly, that moved in three days to the point where we couldn't walk down the paths without brushing past it. And this is it here. Um, yeah, so it, it's quite amazing how it works. And so it's all based on pruning. And we manage the whole thing as a macro organism. So here's a little bit of footage in the peak of the drought. As we can see, we've got very strong photosynthesis and these trees right here that I'm looking at now, this is the species succession moving in. These are coming in, these will replace the eucalypts once the eucalypts get cut out. So we get about three years in our climate out of the eucalypt. You, know, you can get five in a slower growing climate, that's fine. But we always make sure that something else is coming to follow what gets pruned out. And then we're always riding the steep part of the growth curve. It's very, very important. So what we, what we, uh, what we do to really make sure well, this is a very, very important requirement. It's mandatory in this type of agroforestry that we always have enormous amounts of tree seeds planted of every type. We don't discriminate. We get every single tree we can. Right here I'm, I'm, uh, in this video, here are the emergence popping out the top of the lower canopy in low succession. All of the different species combining with strata and we've got a full canopy, even though it's only about four feet high. And this remains constant throughout the, the whole life cycle. Yeah, so going back to the seeds, we, 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 it's the most important thing to get every single seed we can and then we let 
the macroorganism, we let the system select because it knows when to germinate via all of the information shared by the, um, the soil web of life, the fungal network. It's all driven by that, which we call the macroorganism because everything combines to one and synchronizes. So we always synchronize our planting and our pruning. We can put the seeds in any time we like because the thing is, they'll germinate when they're ready. So they'll fall into synchronization, into synchronicity with everything else. Here we're looking under the canopy. There's a lot of life under there. And this is, it's under this canopy where these seeds of the future will germinate. And uh, that becomes a natural nursery. Now, if we want to grow fruit trees in amongst our tree systems, that's fine. But we start them from seed. And if we want a specific species, uh, sorry, a specific um, variety, we graft in situ because it is a natural nursery. Now in the uh, context of, of silver pasture, we can carry fruit trees. That doesn't worry us at all because the fruit, fruit trees can be browsed because it's all timed. It's all timed in with the grazing. And I've brought animals into these systems before. They'll fill their rumen and then they'll mineralize on the trees. But once the grass is grazed, we, can, we move them out. I mean, there's no point having hungry cattle around your trees. And that's why trees get overbrowsed in normal management and set stocking. But we actually get a growth, a growth pulse, a flush from the cattle, or in my case, the cattle browsing the trees. They um, uh, yeah, medicate on the trees. They eat avocado, whatever they like, they eat it. And uh, then they put the minerals through their excreta. So it all comes together very well. And the animals are a very, very, very important part of these systems. And I'm really excited to see where we can go with this. So just moving through this footage, we can see all of the combination of species and we've got extremely strong photosynthetic canopy, stratified with light requirements. So there's zero uh, light wasted. And just here, for example, is a high succession species, the Chisara palm. And these species have got, um, they're adapted to low succession conditions when they're young. So it's very successional based and management oriented. And um, very happy to share any of this from the future with, with anybody who's interested. Very excited about how this will work out in Australia. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Scott. So we're um, we're going over to Michael Taylor now. Michael, are you there? Hi, Michael. Can you hear me, Stuart? Yep, yeah, sure can. Go for it. <laughs> well, th thank you, Stuart, Kelly, Lucy, everybody that's uh, helped get today going. Obviously, this is uh, slightly different to what we'd originally hoped. Hope to have you all out on the farm here in the forest. Um, and thank you very much for Rowan <coughs> speaking this morning and, and earlier and, and Scott. Um, look, just quickly introducing myself. I'm a sixth generation uh, grazier up in the New England Tablelands. Very different climate to the Otways <laughs> and uh, the North Coast. Um, we run uh, two and a half thousand to three and a half thousand sheep here um, and, uh, and a couple of hundred cattle depending on the season. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit, I haven't got much time, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the pines on our particular place um, that's been our species of choice um, due to a, a number of reasons. Um, uh, availability and uh, and climate, and the way we've been able to work them in with our grazing enterprises. So, <clears throat> I often uh, I often have a have a whole day to talk about this stuff. So, trying to fit it into ten minutes. Um, the there's a little bit of video. I don't know whether Lucy or, or Struna are able to put it up, um, but it's part of the reason um, 
we we got to this point. Have you got that video, Lucy, or Struan? Um, there's soil soil erosion. Soil erosion, radio. <laughs> Thanks. This uh, this video might be uh, a little bit distressing to you people. If it's going to come up, this was taken. Uh, this was taken last year, and sorry, 2019, and. Um, like I said, a little bit distressing, but it was a pretty common scene. And uh, Australia has a bit of a record for, for excessive uh, soil loss. And it was an event like this uh, back in the 1980s drought uh, that inspired my parents, John and Vicky, um, to do something about it. <clears throat> yeah, pre pretty horrific. Um, yeah. We were actually... Uh, I was able to I was able to be a bit sheltered come into our forest but uh, it was uh, it was this experience in the 1980s drought uh, that drove my parents to to think about um, getting more trees on the place <clears throat> and uh, they back then didn't have a whole lot of knowledge um, but uh, they've they've since learned a lot but the, basically the journeys led them on a, on a fairly integrated uh, approach to, to trees on the farm. Um, <laughs> three main reasons, uh, the, the three, <clears throat> three, three main reasons for, for getting more trees on the farm were, were obviously shelter and, and shade for the stock. Um, but as it turns out, uh, shelter also for the, for the soils during extreme climate events like the drought in 2019. Secondly, the timber, the timber products as, uh, as Rowan and, and uh, has covered pretty well, but uh, there's been other tree products that we've, we've, uh, we've been able to, that have become obvious to us, to us since. Uh, as Rowan said, the aesthetics and um, and, and also the seeds. We're now producing seeds from our oak trees and also from some of our eucalypts for, for planting elsewhere. And thirdly, as Nick Reed will talk about more uh, next week, the ecosystem services. This is something that my parents could never have uh, predicted uh, would be such a major part, but uh, increases in, in bird numbers on the property um, been quite significant and pest infestations uh, seem to be uh, less intense these days than they used to be. So I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the stages we go through. I'm standing here with a, uh, a, a forest behind me of, uh, of trees that are about 30, uh, 35 years old. Um, back then, like Rowan said, it was very hard for us uh, when it got to the the thinning stage, um, we we were learning a lot about uh, uh, harvest of uh, growing pine trees from the farm forestry situation in New Zealand. This is about 35 or 40 years ago, and um, so the first the first thing we should have been doing was thinning and uh, thinning more than we 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 have. Um, so the thinning was happening around five or ten years, um, a lot sooner than than my parents thought it, it would be happening. Um, we walk around the farm now just in, in disbelief at how quickly actually the trees have, have grown. In Australia, our average uh, forest cycle is, is, is 30 to 40 years. Um, in countries uh, like in Scandinavia, um, they're talking about a forest cycle of, of 80 years. So there's really no reason why, uh, why we shouldn't be able to, to, to be planting and harvesting more more trees. Um, so at, at five to 10 years, we're thinning and pruning, pruning the trees. Behind me here uh, on this other side, these are trees that are only 15 years old. I'm gonna walk down, I'm gonna attempt to walk down in the forest here. Um, so these ones we started pruning at uh, five to 10 years and thinning. And <clears throat> we've, uh, We've, we've got the, the difference between these and the ones above has been quite significant. We've got trees in here that are equivalent in diameter 
to the ones up up the hill um, <clears throat> and, and only 15 years. So we're pruning the trees up to, uh, to two and a half meters. Um, so that we do things a little bit differently. The, the growth rates here are a little bit slower than, than down in the Otways. Um, but we're pruning, pruning up to two and a half meters at five, five to 10 years. And then at, at 10 to 15 years, we're starting to take out, out logs for, for uh, post peeling. And then we, we're taking the, the uh, pruning up to 4.8 meters is what we're aiming at. We find that uh, six meters is a little bit beyond the height that we can generally grow the trees up here. And uh, we've started harvesting logs at, at as young as 15 years. That's uh, 35 to 40 centimeters in, in diameter. <clears throat> um, originally, the, uh, the, the distant goal was to, to prune trees up for the high value product that we'd been told we could, we could by those forest economists that we shouldn't trust. But uh, we'd been told that, that uh, we could potentially be harvesting veneer logs. So we have, we have since uh, had a lot of trees identified as veneer logs. So these are trees that are high pruned and are uh, growing a lot of uh, clear wood and they're, they're, they're uh, harvested at uh, 60 to, to 80 centimeters in diameter. And then they're used for, for producing uh, veneers for, for plywood and, and, and the like. Um, so yeah, just, just, uh, just one of the keys to the success of, of uh, <laughs> I guess, of uh, getting the trees, uh, uh, <laughs> incorporating the trees on our place has been the staged uh, investment as we've, as we've been going. It's very, very easy when you, you get into uh, learning about these things to get a little bit excited and, uh, and, and want to go all out at once. But uh, we've, we've uh, been able to, as I said, we've uh, been able to integrate all our forests with our grazing. The forest I'm standing in here before, just now is obviously quite a dense uh, forest, but we've planted it on a slope. It's quite a rocky slope. Um, I'd, I'd like to show you more, but uh, it, it was a place that wasn't growing much pasture, but now it provides good shelter during, during lambing. So in other areas, we're doing wide space plantings, um, allowing the, the pasture to grow in between. Um, the log peeling and everything, we've, we've uh, gradually uh, invested in more and more machinery, but the the we have some uh, treatment uh, just down the road in Tamworth. So access to, um, to processing has been, been something we've had to figure out. And, uh, um, and the saw, uh, I'd just like to show you another little <laughs> bit of video now. Lucy, you might be able to queue up the video um, just showing harvesting of our pine. Not that one again, that's too distressing. <laughs> There's a harvesting. So we've been able to do everything. Uh... I think, is she? Have you got that other video there? Yes, I do, just one moment, sorry. No worries. So we've been able to, uh... As I said, incorporate. So this is Rowan showed you a lot of this, but uh, so we're just we're just manually harvesting our our timber, and again, as as uh, as Rowan pointed out, uh, thinning and pruning the trees has made this this viable. Um, <coughs> And we're, we're just selecting the best trees for management. So um, trees that are, that are not growing as well as they should, we're leaving them for just for shelter and, uh, and biodiversity. This is the 35 year old tree. As you can see the first few rings, 
quite widely spaced, the tree was growing very quickly. But because the plantation wasn't thinned, trees have been growing. We used a, a skid steer loader for all our forestry uh, hand, log handling. And it's obviously a, a machine that's got a lot of other uses around the farm. Um, this is our uh, twin blade Mahoe mill that we've set up. It's a portable mill. We've set it up permanently uh, in a shed. We could have, uh, we only invested up to a point that um, we didn't have to run this mill full time to make it viable. As you can see, it's a twin, twin blade mill. That's about a 440 centimeter diameter log there. We're cutting a lot of uh, rough sawn, just rough sawn, larger sizes, 200 by 50, 100 by 50 mill boards. So these are not, not the high value that veneer would be, but um, as I said, we've got treatment facilities just down the road in Tamworth, we've been able to, so that was just just quickly. Uh, look, I'm gonna finish, finish up now, but basically those in summary, um, keys to success, the harvesting, the pine on our property has been total integration with our, our grazing enterprises. Um, and the ecosystem services and the shelter have, have pretty much offset the costs of establishment and management. Um, we've done small continuous staged investment. So just small amounts of pruning, establishing small, small areas, um, planning those areas. As I said, uh, we've been able to take advantage of, of choosing choosing our, our, where, where our plantings go to improve our grazing matching the, the landscape, making use of, of, uh, of, you know, rocky hillsides, rocky hilltops that have been low value for, for grazing. And, uh, and, and looking ahead to, to some of the, uh, the higher value products. Um, obviously that's, that's changing. We've learned a lot from Rowan over the years. And these days we're planting other niche uh, varieties of, of trees for, for timber. But, um, <clears throat> But the, the, and thirdly, the, the ecosystem services that, and the, and the natural capital value is something that is yet to be fully realized, but that's something that we could never have predicted. And um, um, the carbon, <clears throat> carbon being stored on the property, we, uh, I, studies that ANU and La Trobe University have done have shown that we're a, a net positive carbon emitter, sequestering over 300 tonnes of CO2 here a year just on, on our 850 hectares. And that's that's alongside our, our, our profitable grazing business. So, um, but yeah, there's there's yet to be a lot to be, uh, to, to be realized in that. So look, I'm gonna leave it there and uh, I'm sure there'll be uh, lots of questions hopefully come out of that. And again, thank you to, to Rowan and Scott for speaking today and, and the Landcare guys for making this possible. Um, hopefully we'll get better at this uh, this webinar game and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Michael. Um, very interesting. Um, Lucy or Kelly, are you there to facilitate the question and answer? If anyone's got any questions, type them into your chat box and then um, Lucy or Kelly, whoever's there, will um, speak them out to the audience. So. And I'll be typing the answers back into the chat box. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so if anyone's got any questions, just um, yeah, type them into the chat box and I can read them out if you want to write who the question is directed to as well. Um, and we can make sure that, that they're listening. Thanks, Kelly. So we'll just give everyone a couple of minutes just to think of their questions and and put them in, um, we'll go from there. Michael, 
what species work or don't work at your place? <laughs> um, yeah, look, we've tried, we've tried a hell of a lot of different uh, species here. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, it, it won't be a comprehensive list, but um, a lot of the, uh, we, we did actually try redwoods. Um, we put a couple of hundred in a few years ago and we thought we had a really good location for them. And uh, unfortunately, uh, they didn't survive uh, the dry. And then we had some very, very hot days um, during the summer following. And we think um, they succumbed to the heat. But um, we'll, probably, we'll probably try again. Um, we've planted, uh, we've, my parents have uh, got on to collecting a lot of different exotic species. Um, we're now, we're, we're trying a lot of different natives, natives to this area, natives beyond the, the area. But uh, Quercus, the oaks, oak family is a very large, uh, large family of trees, uh, very similar to the eucalypts, but, but native to the Northern hemisphere. We've collected over 90 species. We know that we've got about 70 plus still growing on the property. Uh, oaks uh, have a very large range of, of habitat and uh, from, from uh, snowy mountains, dry high deserts to, to even tropical Southeast Asia. And um, we've, uh, we've been trialing a lot of those. They also uh, hybridize similar to the, to the eucalypts a little bit. So we're, we're starting to get a few interesting hybrids in the seeds that are, that are produced on ours on the farm. Um, we've tried a lot of poplars in, in some of our wetter areas and willows, but we found the willows, there's, there's also probably about 20 or 30 different willows that we've tried, but a lot of them succumbed actually in the 2019 drought and some had already died out in the last 2013-14 drought. So uh, we've also have tried a number of other, uh, a lot of other conifers on the place and uh, some of them have, have been good, but the, obviously the radiata pine, um, you know, have been chosen because they do have a very, very wide range. Um, natives, we're starting to get a lot of uh, natural uh, recruitment again, um, but we're trying a lot of, a lot of other natives from, from outside the area, lots of different shrubs. We're, we're finding as the, as the, the landscape changes, some of those species are doing, uh, are doing better uh, now that they've got the, the shelter around. So um, I hope that helps it. I, like I said, it's very hard to be specific um, on, on which species, yeah. Does, does, that, does that help? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've just got a couple of comments. Just got to scroll back a bit. Um, to Rowan and Michael, what process did you go through to choose the species planted in the terms of marketing sales or do you grow process only for your own enterprise? I'll let you I'll, I'll have a go. Yeah, I'll, I'll have a go. We've got about 70 species of uh, timbers and uh, a lot of it's just so I can learn about themselves and uh, take that information because you, if you're growing species in a climate or for a purpose or in a way with regard to the management that, uh, that isn't, hasn't been done so much before, don't expect to find references or experts that can tell you. You know, Michael's uh, exam, family example has really illustrated that you don't there's, there's no book that says which oaks are going to grow in New England tableland. So, you know, you can go to the street trees. And what I often do to go, go to parks and gardens and look at what trees have performed. And uh, particularly given that we know that those parks, private houses and street trees have gone through droughts and have been tested over a period, then I research the wood qualities. And uh, there's a range of different characteristics I'm looking for in a species. To, to give me some unique marking advantage if they do perform well. And that would be the, the characteristics of the, uh, of the wood grain, uh, the presence of uh, ray cells like English oak and silky oak and casuarinas, how prominent they are, because that's a bit of marketing advantage. The color of the wood, 
uh, not to say that any color is better, but having a range of colors is, is an advantage. Uh, red is dead at the moment, blondes are in, but that's gonna change. Uh, the presence of uh, things like natural feature, kino, uh, and the role of kino is a, and a drought response in some of the eucalypt species. It used to be a negative, now it's a positive. So you can plant more messmate and those species that have that, uh, although that is a fashion that that could change. And the key for many of us as landholders, uh, I think a priority should be given to species that are class one or two durable. Uh, class one is in the ground for 25 years or so, uh, traditional fence most, post or stump material. Class two is durable out above ground outside for 25 years or so. Decking material, uh, shed, shed building above ground. These species are not the traditionally one, ones that have traditionally been grown in forestry because they're not as fast. But as a private landholder, you're able to use that timber more yourself, sell it to your neighbours, and the processing requirements for outdoor timbers like decking and uh, and posts are uh, much less accurate accuracy and much less control of moisture than you need if you're going to sell it for furniture. Uh, furniture is almost the most difficult uh, because moisture content and and uh, checking and dry and degrade, they're all much bigger issues. Doesn't matter if you're using it for decking or siding or, or something like that. So when it comes to a eucalypt, I will only plant class one or two now uh, of eucalypts. Uh, so in our area, you know, we're growing tallow wood, red iron bark, spotted gums, uh, yellow stringy, and I've dropped all the, uh, the class, class three and four, uh, shining gum, uh, mountain ash, and, uh, and, um, and that sort of group, it's, your markets are gonna be much more limited. So think about where you might have an advantage in terms of selling, because you're always gonna be small. Uh, don't compete with the big growers. Uh, so funnily enough, I wouldn't have normally said pine trees, uh, Michael, but uh, now that we're building our house, uh, there's a shortage of pine scantling and I'm glad I've got my own. And uh, I'm, I'm finding that it will mill a, uh, a mill a pine log for our house framing timbers. Uh, I get about six to eight hundred dollars worth of timber uh, from each log, and uh, that's not a bad return for the half a day or something required to harvest and mill that out. And certainly beats um, going to going off and buying knotty pine uh, when I can use my own clear timber for for structural framing. And uh, at the moment, you can't apparently can't buy much structural timber. It's all been taken by the big home builders. And uh, so the market's a bit short. So maybe even pine's okay because we're at engineering timbers, but not so much appearance grade. So that's a few ideas there. Yeah, I, I, I would. I was going to. I didn't have time, but um, just quickly, the the pines were found uh, at the farm gate. The prices, um, if you can, the more processing you can do, um, the prices go up quite uh, dramatically. We're talking uh, 20 to $40 a, a cubic meter just for, for a, a, a pine log um, uh, th that's been un unpruned. And then uh, for just a veneer log um, at the farm gate, maybe $80, $90 a, a cubic meter. Rough sawn green pine, um, as Rowan said, uh, that a lot of the non-structural uh, grades it can be rough sawn and and uh, not not as dried and we're talking 150 to sort of two 250 dollars a cubic meter um once they're dried with again it goes up to 250 400 dollars a cubic meter if we go and get it treated um it, there's a cost obviously to get it get it treated and brought back here but the price quickly goes up to to sort of six seven hundred dollars a cubic meter and um, in the future, we're hoping to, to, to dress some of our timber for furniture grade, and you're looking at uh, you know, 1,000 to, to $1,200 a cubic meter. So you can see it doesn't, doesn't take too, too much extra processing and the value of the timber goes up quite, quite a bit. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Um, another question. Hi, Mike. Interested to hear about the studies showing the hill is now a big net sequester of carbon. What percent of the 850 hectares do you 
have under trees now? 20%? Um, and, yep. Sorry. And where do <laughs> yep. you think the break even percent point at the hills is for net? <laughs> um, uh, it's a bit like how long is a piece of string, but uh, at the moment we're only we're 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 only probably about uh, uh, 18, 19 percent tree cover on the property. Um, we think we're, we're we're we we can probably go to maybe 30 percent. So that's that's quite a bit more. We've uh, we've planted about 250,000 trees on the on the place here. Uh, we're putting in another two or 3,000 trees a year. Um, as I said, those uh, studies that were done uh, were based on the, um, well, they were actually a, an upgrade from the, from the carbon modeling. Um, sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head. So there's uh, Mark Gardner at Vanguard and uh, Sue Ogilvy at, um, um, she was at ANU, but La Trobe University are just starting, like I said, another study now, and they're extending it to to uh, in, in in much more detail. Um, but the initial, like I said, the initial modelling was actually quite conservative, and we were surprised um, that the trees were actually having that much effect on on how much carbon we were we were adding to the the property. Um, yes, we did stay profitable throughout the drought. I think I saw a question there, and uh, but we were coming very close to having to sell uh, all our stock uh, due to the water situation. Uh, we still had plenty of feed on the ground. I, well, I wouldn't say plenty of feed, but we still had feed on the ground, but water was our main issue. If we'd had to sell all our stock or adjust our stock elsewhere, um, knowing that we had a, a, a viable uh, timber business, um, we could continue uh, bringing in uh, wages and income from from our from our timber without any stock on the place. That was that was a, a a really big relief to have that as a backup during the drought. And that's something that I don't think there would be many farms in this area that, especially on the tablelands, maybe off to the east and the west where there's more timber grown. But um, to have that as a, as a backup was was uh, was a huge huge relief. Any more questions? I can post some more details on on those studies if you want. With one of them is published, and and the other one is um, is just going into more detail. Um, I have another one. Oh, sorry, Stuart. No, you're right. I was just going to say I am developing a resource list, which I'll send out to everyone, Michael. So if you want to provide something for that. Um, when the series is finished. Um, sorry, Kelly. No, that's all right. Um, just another question for Rowan. If you remove eucalypt from black, um, black pine area, how long before you can plant trees again? So, what is this black pine? Are you talking about the native pine? If so, it sounds like you're intending to remove native forests and you probably can't do that for a start. If you're talking about a planted area, you can't convert native forest. You can get management uh, uh, support. You can get uh, you can manage a native forest, but you can't change this land use in most states. Um, the, the main issue there won't be anything chemical. It'll just be physical and water based. Uh, so, you know, you probably need to, a period of fallow. Uh, in order to re-water re the site. Uh, but if you have a good wet winter, you should be ready for planting almost straight away. If you're cutting out eucalypts or pines uh, or, or any dominant species, uh, it's probably gonna be how dry the site is. And uh, that will reflect uh, re-wetting ability that you've got. Uh, there, are, there, are, there are chemicals that uh, in pines that uh, need to break down before you can replant pines on a Pinus radiata site, uh, but that gen they generally or you're ready, uh, depending on the soil type and if there's enough biological activity to break them down. Uh, but if you wait, if you wait a season, that's probably unlikely to be an issue. Um, thanks, Ron. Another question for you: Rethinning in mixed species stands. If different species have different ideal densities, how would you approach thinning? 
Well, you can actually, yeah, great question that, because uh, first of all, you're almost doing a single tree silviculture. So the way I tackle it, I identify a tree that I want to keep and then identify uh, based on its species uh, shade tolerance. So I can have eucalypts growing over the top of it if it is a silky oak or a red cedar, uh, but I can't have any of the dark heavy canopy uh, competing with it. So in a sense, a uh, little bit like Scott said, you've actually got these uh, uh, different strata in your forest and you can manage the understory quite differently uh, in terms of, uh, of spacing to the overstory. If the overstory is a, a, a species like eucalypts that don't provide much shade competition. Uh, so I do it on an individual tree basis. Uh, the easiest way to think of that is just look up uh, at the canopy and see if there's another tree that that uh, impinging on the ability for that canopy to stay active. Uh, so you'll find if there's trees on one side that there's not much leaf on that side. If you thin any trees on that side of the tree, you will stimulate more leaf growth uh, response. And as a result of that, you'll get a more balanced canopy and more leaf, it just means faster growth. So with all these species, it's about leaf area uh, and maximizing the leaf area if you wanna maximize the diameter growth. Of course, you don't always just want to maximise diameter growth because you've got a range of different species there. So you're quite happy to just maintain growth. But um, thinning is the big one. And I know there's a lot of questions further, further back, uh, thinning a, a Casuarina uh, River Shea Oak stand. Um, the comment I made in my presentation is a lot of people don't thin because they think they deserve a market somehow for every thinning. Um, you'll, if you just measure the trees, you'll find out what you're missing out on. Measure some trees every year, document if some of them, like River Shea Oak, you can write the diameter on the stem. If that diameter growth is much lower than what it was in the past, competitions affecting performance, uh, you will get a thinning response if you get in there quickly and, uh, and thin around it. That thinning response is effectively putting the leaf that you're sharing across two or three trees on one tree and you'll get a much rapid, almost some of the trial work I've done, six times faster diameter growth compared to unthinned forest. And that's uh, you know, six times faster in one year. So it could be five millimetres compared to uh, uh, two or three centimetres growth. And uh, that could be a big difference in terms of how long you wait. So don't, don't try to make, make money out of everything, uh, uh, every thinning. And think of it as uh, improving the forest when you do. Some of the thinning we do is by ring barking. Uh, standing deadwood is a really good biodiversity asset. Uh, kill the tree standing. We also stem indirect herbicide into some trees to kill them standing. That reduces the, the time and the danger of doing the thinning operation, but it also reduces the fire hazard and releases the growing space very slowly. The tree dies uh, and doesn't lead to all that dead wood on the ground that could be a, a hazard, hazard if you're actually uh, traveling through. It, they'll eventually fall over when they do their they're very, they're dry, so they're light and they do little damage to other trees if they're not too large in diameter. So there's an idea, but not in the forest that you have a picnic. Um, thanks, Rowan. There's no other questions at the moment. Um, so, Struan, did we want to continue and go on with the workshop or? Yeah. Yes, I think we'll go to Karen, who um, is going to run the um, the workshop. So, hi everybody. Um, I'm Karen Zerkler. I also work for Southern New England Land Care. Um, it's been great so far. Thanks everybody so far. It's uh, yeah, been very interesting. Um, we thought we would do a, um, a short workshop session to help everybody digest what's, um, what we've learned so far. What we're gonna do is work in some breakout groups. There are going to be six groups and you will be all randomly assigned to a group. So there'll be about five people in each group. Um, you will get just five minutes to address each question and there are gonna be three questions. So it's going to be a very rapid, um, a, a rapid fire process, um, and you'll be assigned randomly um, to those groups. I think I said that already. So um, follow the prompts if you've never done this before. Just follow the prompts on your screen when they come. Um, once in the group, just 
quickly introduce yourself, make sure you turn your video on. It's always nice to see um, who you're talking to, talking with and your audio, um, be sure that that's on. And also be sure that your chat box is, is on as well because we're going to ask you to, um, to talk about, we're gonna present a question for you to talk about in your group. Um, and then we just want someone to scribe up, you know, your key insights into that, into that um, um, chat box and then come back to us all um, with what you've, what you've come up with. So about to assign you all to your first group and the question, the first question, I will repeat these questions each as we go through. The first question is going to be what stood out for you? What did you learn that stood out for you? The second one's going to be um, what do you see as the climate change challenges? And the third one's going to be, what do you feel confident to change now that you've heard what you've heard today? Um, so the first one, we're gonna just do five minutes um, on what stood out for you. So here we go. Kelly, uh, are you happy just to press the button and get everybody to go to their group?
So, Karen, there was five different rooms there. Did you want to go through and ask the rooms one by one um, what the answers were they came up with? You're just on mute, Karen. About that. Um, yeah, if we could just get maybe one key point from each of the groups. I know um, we might need to, we might need to change the groups down a little bit, Kelly, for the next round. Because I can see we've got a few less people now than what we had before. Um, so if we went to say three groups or four groups or something instead of six. Um, but from group number six, which I was part of, um, there were a few key points, um, but probably one of them, the main one was probably the value of that really practical information that was provided by Michael that was really valued. So any of the other groups like to just make a key point about what you discussed? Or you can just type it in if you like into the chat box. Um, I'm happy to talk about my group. Um, I'm not sure what number it was. But, um, um, I think um, the value adding was of interest to people. Um, choice of species and therefore ground cover and water quality, like active growing plants and the carbon, and planting a range of trees into the landscape, and the emphasis on people. Um, as well, um, stood out for people. So there's three key points. <laughs> Great. What about any of the other groups? Did anyone? Yeah, so in our, our group, the main points were the, the point about the individual tree silviculture in a mixed uh, mixed stand was that stuck out. The um, the the tree management being a, a, a succession rather than rotation. There was the application of principles and the, the thing of using trial and error to determine what works best in your situation. Great, thank you, Ray. That's really good. Um, I can go Michael. from group, group one if you want. Yeah, so group, group one. Um, yeah, there was an interesting point about the, the uh, down in the Hunter Valley, the, the, uh, um, pointing out what, what tree for what, what purpose. Uh, I think that was right, Simon. But but actually changing the uh, the wording um, and thinking about uh, why why are you planting trees uh, rather than picking on uh, specific species um, and and the species selection will will uh, tend to to sort itself out rather than um, and we've definitely found that on, on the property here. Um, as, as we've gone along over the last 40 years, uh, species that we selected um, previously haven't turned out. Um, and ecosystem function is, is possibly uh, looking at the bigger picture rather than specific species. And, uh, and the other, other point was um, uh, thinking about how to manage uh, a massive amount of Meliodora regrowth. Um, um, considering the options to managing managing it rather than clearing and eradicating parts of it um, and, and the succession possibilities there. I think that was the, the point. Great. Thank you, Michael. If, if there are no... So, so in our group, uh, uh, using Mike's example, uh, uh, the point about growing exotics to actually support natives and uh, being able to... to include exotic species in, in the uh, suite of paint colours that you've got. Uh, Michael wouldn't have been able to provide the shelter for his native trees if he didn't have pines that can tolerate that sort of exposure. So we've, a lot of landscapes have been so, so exposed now that it's very hard to get natives to grow well. And maybe we can incorporate some uh, exotic species to ac actually provide shelter for them. Great, thanks Rowan. All right. Um... Unless anyone's desperate to share uh, something else, I'd like to move us on to the next little breakout group. And again, it's, you're only going to get five minutes. It's not, not very long. Um, you'll be randomly allocated and you'll probably see some new faces this time. But your question is, what do you see as the climate change challenges 
um, for species selection if we want vegetation success, re if we want revegetation success? What do you see as the climate change challenges for species selection if we want revegetation success into the future? So off you go. See you soon. Where's the dog going, Charlie? So hi, Karen, we had the same three people in the same small group. So, um, all right, let's see if we can fix that next time. Um, but it doesn't really matter, I guess. Um, no. Anyway, uh, how did you go? Um, is, would anybody like to just report in on... Uh, what they found? Did anyone like? Would any and and also add it to the um, chat box if you wouldn't mind? That'd be great. I think Mark, you should you should talk to this one. 
Um, my my uh, point was I just thought that organisations should look at um, uh, allowing a, a variety of uh, exotics within their criteria for, for projects that local land service and and um, land care sort of fund, um, where at present you're sort of penalised if you try and plant exotics and that, that, that may be better for the situation. Um, and uh, you know, help help establish the natives. So uh, I think they need to broaden their criteria of, of species um, that we're allowed to plant. Thanks, Mark. Great. Um, any of the other groups? Uh, I'd be happy to go. We we uh, there was just two of us in our room, so. <laughs> We were discussing uh, the, the Meliodora and, and Caliganosa, which are two of the potential timber species on the New England here. And um, um, yeah, we're, I'm standing in the middle of a Caliganosa. So this is the yellow stringy bark plantation here. It's one that we're not getting any natural recruitment in. And it's potentially one that will also struggle uh, into the future. Um, if, if climate change continues the way it has been. Um, these, these ones that we're planted seem to be doing all right, but we're just not getting the natural recruitment um, as compared to some of the, a lot of the other local eucalypt species. So um, it, it, it'll be interesting going forward. And, and that's another reason why we've been plant, trying so many other exotics. Thanks, Michael. I'm just getting a bit conscious of the time and I've just got one more question that I'd like to um, get you to discuss. I've just re redone the, the chat rooms, uh, the breakout rooms, so you should see a few more people for this last question. Um, and for those, could someone from each group please put in the chat area um, just one or two, two key points um, that you've discussed. So, um, the final question is, what do you now feel confident to change as a result of today? What do you now feel confident to change? So I'm going to open up the rooms now and get you to do five minutes together.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, just a really quick um, wrap up now from group one. Could we have a, a quick little point from, from you guys? What, who's, who's numbers one? Uh, that was Andrew Gardner, Chris Everly, um, Deanna, Gordon Williams and Oscar. Anyone would want to unmute themselves and just give us a quick little report? Or we can move on to uh, Gordon here. Yep, thanks, Gordon. Uh, two of the points that came up was um, just continue to try new species that we think might um, adapt to the area. And my particular point was that, yeah, we have to keep changing, keep adapting. But the most important thing for me is uh, um, we all need to share information right across our operations, um, whether that's species, financial, the whole... Um, managing the whole system to be productive and environmentally uh, secure. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, someone from room two, which was Kevin, Mark, Michael, Nick, and Vicky. Uh, Mark and Kevin both uh, spoke, and um, uh, Mark pointed out, yeah, that uh, he's interested in. in Keep keep trying, changing new things, thinking about where the where the trees are, are planted, and uh, rather than just planting trees in an open space. And um, sorry, Kevin, are you there? <laughs> Can you? <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I'm here, and I think that the important point I think Mark made previously is just have a plan in place, and that's I think what shows in 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 good good. Uh, farm forestry practices, as, as you've seen with Michael at the Hill and his parents and with Rowan and, and Andrew Stewart, is have that plan in place and uh, and just keep adapting it as, as, as needed. Fantastic. Thank you, Kevin. Um, let's go to room three, which was Gary, Julia, Quentin and Ray. Would anyone like to give us a quick point? I'll have a quick go at it. I think we, one of the things was mentioned was that you do have to keep trying different things because what, what, what uh, I think Gary said was that what works one year in a, plant, in a planting mix isn't what's going to work the next year. And yeah, we keep, keep thinning, keep pruning. Um, yeah, look at each, each tree, make sure it's got, got what it needs to grow. Great, thank you very much, Ray. And finally, we had Rowan, Struan and Walker, um, KT Walker. Yeah, Karen, um, the, the main theme that we had running through was the uh, restrictions of uh, legislation, the, um, the programs that the government departments are running out seem too uh, restricted to look at a whole range of species. And sometimes the legislation led to perverse outcomes in terms of maintenance of the, um, uh, of the stand and what the, the final outcome would be for uh, revegetation programs and, and what species could be planted. And also from the other side was um, those programs are defined and guided by the upper echelon of the department, the legislation and the program guidelines themselves as to what can be planted. So maybe we need to um, get everyone talking about more flexibility, right tree, right plant for the right purpose over time. Thanks so much, that was, that's great. Um, well, that's a bit of a wrap for us for today. We're at the end of our um, time together, but I am just gonna hand back to Struan to just remind you about part two next week and um, and do the final wrap up. Thanks, Joan. Um, okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. And I hope people who left early, um, we, see, we get to see them again next week. That'd be great. Um, so next week, we'll be hearing from Nick Reid on um, ecosystem services or the biodiversity benefits of silver pasture about seed collection from Andrew Gardner, who's from Fields Environmental Solutions in Urella. 
and planting techniques from Chris Everly at Kentucky Tree Nursery. So still another great um, part two coming up and um, really enjoyed today. I hope you all did too. Um, thank you very much and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. 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 Thanks.